Welcome back, folks. Thanks for coming back. We are here to finish up this afternoon's Administering SQL Server 2012 Jumpstart. I'm Rich Curry. I'm here with Mr. George Squalacci, SQL in his name. George, what do we got coming up next? Well, for the back nine, we have some good topics. Uh, now that we have a solid platform of SQL Server, we've installed the product, have configured server and database level options, learned how to make sure the product is running optimally, now we have to take a look at some data stewardship that will be managing data module for security and high availability to follow. So for this particular module, we're going to take a look at managing data, data stewardship, things like that. Alrighty. Moving over to the overview, uh, there's uh, a phrase that the DBA should uh, take to heart, and that is tag I'm it. <laughs> Usually, we yeah. end up with everything. Tag, I'm it. So I am, as the database administrator, I am the data steward. So we'll take a look at protecting data as a data steward, which means not only duplicating it via the backup process, but also when the chips are down, Rich, yeah. we got to be able to put it back down, got to be able to restore. So we'll look at backups, backup strategy, restores, and then some other database maintenance and administration kinds of tasks like moving databases entirely or just relocating their files, maintaining database integrity, some other tools like that. So that's up uh, for this particular module. All right. So, of course, whenever anything goes wrong, you want to make sure that you have a backup strategy or a restore. What? A backup. Yeah, a backup. Absolutely. We got to be able to back it up so that we can recover it later. Now, I imagine, especially for those of you that have uh, a good amount of experience with the product, the backing up and recovery models, they're not brand new, but I do want to challenge you for the exam that you've walked all the way through the process of learning the different backup, or different recovery models, different backup types, and I will tell you, um, there is an X factor, uh, some aspect of unknown when you actually come to a point where you have to restore, recover a database or a whole system, some unknowns that are going to pop up, you must have walked through the process to recover. And that way, when the X factors come up, uh, it won't be any more difficult than otherwise. Absolutely. So the first thing we have to take a look at is a quick look at the recovery models. No, there are only three, so that makes the decision-making process a little easier. As long as you know what they are and what they do. So the model database is used whenever a new database is created. It's copied, so whatever options it has, those will be applied to a new database unless they're overridden. The model database after installation is the full recovery model, and this is the most complete recovery model. It permits point-in-time recovery, and uh, a recovery from failed media. Bulk logged recovery model, actually I'm going to skip to simple for a moment. With the simple recovery model, we'll find out that we are able to restore full backups and differential backups. But the way that the log file is maintained is different with the simple recovery model. Transactions after they've been logged into the log file and then rolled forward into the database are truncated which is where the previous name of the simple recovery model got its name, truncate log on checkpoint. So there's no data in the log file that permits point-in-time recovery. And in fact, if you try to perform a transaction log backup on a database with a simple recovery model, it's not even an available option. So now picture straddling between two different uh, possibilities. That's really the bulk logged recovery model, and it's not really a perpetual model that you'll stay in. This is an interim model that you'll use when you're going to perform bulk operations. So uh, the, the point is certain operations are minimally logged, and when in the bulk logged uh, recovery model, you'll take up less log space, there's less over overhead with the uh, uh, bulk import operation, so it's more efficient. So the full model recovers all, of, has the ability to trace and track all of the work done. The simple just gives you enough to, re, to restart the database if you need it. Exactly. So there are times where maybe I have a developer copy of a database. It doesn't need to have absolutely everything to the nearest moment. Or maybe I have a database that I can refresh easily from some other process. So a simple recovery model might make sense for some of those. 
I, I have the options because they're reasonable in certain cases. So what about the backup itself? What are the different statements and options that you can use there? So you can see that not only do we back up the database files, but we also have a separate statement for backing up and protecting and managing the log file. There are a bunch of options that, are, that come along with each of these. And in particular for the test takers, you are going to want to know the most popular, uh, the most popular options like with differential, with init, no init, format, uh, some of those other ones. And what about making sure that your backups actually were successful, that they worked, that you can go out and make use of them later? Sure. Uh, picture a scenario where I might have an awful lot of databases and an awful lot of backup files. Uh, now, let's say you're the primary DBA, you're out with an unexpected gallbladder operation. Oh, Tag, boy. I'm it. Yep. Now, I'm the one that has to go in and restore, and I might not know what your particular strategy was for storing and naming files. So now I have to take a look at the contents of those backups before I actually use them. So we have a number of integrity and fact-finding kinds of statements that we can use against backup files. Cool, what are those all about? So we have restore verify only, restore header only. We'll see these in an upcoming demonstration and the types of information that they provide. Lots and lots of facts other than one of them. What's three, that? three give a lot of facts, and we'll get to the one that doesn't give us a whole lot of information other than okay or mm, not okay. All right, so leave me sitting on the on the edge of my seat. We'll come back to as it, huh? I often do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so is it this? Do we have the same concerns about backing up system databases that we do backing up user databases? Some general concerns are the same, but there are special considerations uh, related to the system databases. Uh, first of all. Um, with a couple of the system databases, if they are corrupt to a certain degree, you're not going to have a, a usable SQL Server. Let me be uh, more clear. So the master database, if it's corrupt uh, to a certain degree, the SQL Server service will not start. Okay. And in that case, you don't have a SQL Server instance. So that's obviously a game breaker. Additionally, if your MSDB database is corrupt, then the agent service will not start. And uh, although I've never run into this, if the model database in some weird way would get corrupt, I don't know how, but if it were, that could also actually stop the SQL Server service from, pardon me, from running. Okay. Um, additionally, <laughs> additionally uh, you don't want to change the recovery models of the system databases. Uh, the write there means uh, there is the possibility of changing that on MSDB if you wanted to, but more than likely, you're just going to back that up in full every time you back it up and you would restore it in full rather than worrying about a point in time recovery. And I know, sorry, don't press me off, uh, for off the top of my head, but uh -uh. with one or more of the system databases, even if you change the recovery model, it doesn't change what actually happens. That's a peculiarity with them. Cool. So why don't we go take a look at that? George is going to show us how do the backup statements work and the different effects that they've got and some of those backup integrity statements that he was talking about just a minute ago as well. All right. So let me make sure uh, I see what instance we're connected to, just to double check. Yeah, okay. So, so I'm going to create a database that we'll use for our purposes. And uh, some of the information that I, uh, that I used for uh, preparing for this presentation is this link up there. I just wanted you to see that. Um, now what I'm going to do is create a destination for the backup. And I'm going to use uh, what's called a device. Pardon okay. Me. What does well, a device do? A, a device is a friendly name. Really, it's no more than a convenience feature. Uh, a convenient destination, friendly name that I'll use for a backup destination rather than some lengthy, complicated path with spaces and, and things like that. So I'll create my device. Strangely, if you were to right-click on that device under Server Objects, Backup Devices, and you tried to look at its contents, it would say that nothing is there right now. So there won't be any content until you actually back that up. Now, so, I'm going to put some data in the database, and then I'm going to back it up. I'm going to use just a basic backup statement, back up the database, a couple basic options, and this will be the first backup that I have 
for that particular database. And let's see what I biffed here. Did I add an underscore in the name? Nah, it was giving you a device. The file doesn't exist, I believe. So, well, we'll just make this easy. Yeah, just specifying it, and that brings up a good point, that you do have the ability to use devices, or you can code oh. the actual location in using single quotes around the location. That's right. So this time, let's go professional and check, check my code. Well, Rich, we're file getting a little low. File equals disk equals. Oh, yeah, I have to have, see, that's a, a syntax change. With the device, I don't need that. Right. So now let's check syntax. And I do appreciate you being my second set of eyes. Okay, this is one of those moments that every DBA and every developer gets into. You can stare at the trees for 10 minutes and you still can't see the forest. So let's. Uh, da, 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 da. Good effort on troubleshooting here. Uh, incorrect syntax with. Uh, I tell you what, how about if we just back it up with the GUI? There you go. And then we'll script it out. How's that? So we're going to add in our device here, specifying the location in the GUI, and giving it a file name. Keep talking. All righty. And now that I have the uh, destination, I have my backup. All right. So now I'm going to change some data, back up the log. Okay. And then I'll have to back that up to a device as well. So we're going to go back in and again using the GUI. This time we are going to choose a transaction log backup and specify the destination. We can either put it to the same file as it's set here, or we can send it to a different destination. Yep. And notice that I'm going to append to the existing backup set. That equates to the T-SQL option of with no init. Okay. So that means add to the current file. Make some more modifications. So next what I'm going to do We'll take a look at the backup device that I made. And Rich, remind me, what was that? Uh, D, D colon slash backups. backups HC dot back. Does that sound right? Uh, we'll find out in a second, won't we'll we? We'll find out in a second. When you go off the reservation with backups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Un sometime, unscripted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It happens all the time. Or is it from file equals? Yep. Is it warmer in here now? It's getting hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what happens so, when you're under the spotlight and things are going south here. Yeah, I promise I looked at this. Yeah, right click, go to backups, find the device. Sorry? Right click So where? if we go in, let's, let's verify that file location first off. Yeah, okay, so we have to go to Windows Explorer. No, that's of my local machine, not my virtual machine. There it is. Yeah, D drive. Well, isn't that curious? <laughs> we lost the file. Well, actually, the, the, <laughs> the folder didn't exist. I thought I had an automation procedure to make that so it wasn't made to begin with. Okay. All right. Let's try this for recovery now. Uh, Elise, I imagine we're getting some pretty funny uh, comments. <laughs> okay, so this just goes to show that no matter how long you've been doing things and no matter how many times you've done the same thing, yeah, it's called brainus interruptus. Okay? My goodness. 
and we'll give George a second here to kind of get things going. Yeah. But I, I really think... and truly what we're talking about here is trying to look at the contents of the backup file to retrieve what's in there, right, George? Absolutely. So let's say I did use a command where I listed, uh, this was going to be part of the punchline, <laughs> I had maybe a couple of full backups, I had a couple differential backups, inter, uh, intermingled with some log file backups, now I need to find out what's in that file, when it was last taken, maybe the range of log sequence numbers to compare that with another log, uh, with yep. another backup, all the good juicy information that I would want to find, I need to be familiar with uh, these uh, verification statements. So we have restore verify only. I have to give away the end of the movie now. And what we'll find <laughs> out is when I use uh, restore verify only, if there's no problem, I get absolutely minimal feedback. It just says the backup is okay. Okay. So not much there. Now these others, if I want to get a look at maybe uh, the subject line of the backup, I have restore header, header only, I can get uh, facts on the particular items within the backup file, so files within files, file list only, and then also label only. They all give me slightly different overlapping information depending on what I happen to be seeking. So, okay. So those are the verification statements uh, that we planned on looking at. All right, that's good for that. All right, and, and this also does bring up uh, a little bit of a topic. You really, really do want to make sure that as you're going through your backups and setting them up, this is a good place to kind of throw in. When backups go bad, what do you need to do? You need to test them and make sure that they actually worked, and this is a good lesson on that one. Very good object lesson indeed. All right. For our next topic, we're going to take a look at restores and recovery. So there's a process that's undertaken by the database engine during a restore. You want to be familiar with that. There are different kinds of restores, actually a pretty good laundry list of available restore options. You want to be familiar with those. Um, there are restore statements in the same way that there were backup statements. And then, yes, system databases have uh, special consideration as well. So one of the charters of uh, the restoration process, and to back up just a little bit, if you have enough instances and databases, it's not if. It's when. It's when. And I was telling you the other day about uh, a story that happened to me. Nobody likes paying their auto insurance, right? Nobody likes doing that mundane, uh, you know, the kind of work that you're, you're not really congratulated for. But something uh, when my son was two possessed him to scratch all the way around my car. Oh, dear. I kid you not. Uh, the auto insurance company decided to uh, process a claim for it. I was grateful for that. But nonetheless, uh, that's, that's when you want it to matter, uh, when, when you need the recovery part. And so uh, backing up is great, but you're going to have to be able to uh, actually perform restore. So we'll see that there's a process involved in the recovery process. Namely, uh, I have to lay all of my backed up data on the file system. So the combination of full backups, differential, and log backups, after that, we're going to have all of our log data, and in the log data for a running database, likely there will be transactions that were hardened to the log that were not completed. They need to be peeled out, and there, there are transactions in the log that were hardened but never got applied to the database, and they need to be rolled forward. So collectively, we refer to this as copy, redo, and undo. Now, from a big picture standpoint, well, there are a few general principles. Well, uh, first, you don't want to make the situation worse. Uh, so, uh, I guess that's just a general principle. Calm down, you might be found in a stressful situation. Um, there's a situation where my server may be intact, but maybe my data file somehow has a problem. I lost the media or the LUN that it sits on. In that case, as long as the SQL Server service is running, you're able to capture all the way to the end of the end of the log, the tail of the log, we call it, which means you're going to want to back that up. That's going to be uh, one of your early on procedures in the recovery process. And in fact, built into the product, if you don't attempt to back up the tail of the log, you will be barked at and it will tell you, you have to override to do any other uh, 
kind of behavior there. Absolutely. So now, what would be the normal series of restore events that you'd have? We see these at the bottom of the slide. I'm going to lay down my most recent full. Okay. Followed by my most recent differential. All right. Differentials are cumulative, so I only need my most recent one. Followed by the series of every log file since that differential, followed by the tail of the log. So you've got all of those different actions, but what are the different ways that you can apply them? What are the different combinations that you can use? Are there different kinds of restore strategies that are available? Yeah, sure. So if I have the simple recovery model, we looked at the fact that I have no log data to restore. So okay. I'm only going to be able to restore either just a full backup okay. or full plus most recent differential if I incorporated that into my strategy. Okay. I will tell you, you're going to want to know the sequence of events and the, and the series of the process uh, for the exam well, definitely. All right. Uh, now, if I have a full recovery, I have more to work with. That's true. So I have the full database that I have to lay down as what we call a baseline restore. Okay. After that, the most recent differential, and then a series of log files all the way uh, till the end of the log, unless I want something fancy that we'll take a look at shortly. All right. Um, I might have uh, might have to restore a system database. So we have system database restores, and then some fancier or esoteric uh, kinds of restores. If I have an advanced uh, database design, I might need to restore just a single file or all the files in a particular file group. Now, an ultimate fancy, if my application is already architected for this, all right. is that I can perform uh, an online restore where I bring the database online file group by file group. Now, wait a minute. If I hear the word online, I'm thinking it's available for people to use? That's right. It's available in pieces on a file group by file group basis. So you would have had to have backed it up file group by file group to start with, right? Um, it's very strange. I can actually back up the database in full and still do a file-based restore. I wouldn't usually do it that way. I would have probably performed a file by file backup, but I can actually do a per file restore from a full backup. I've, I've done this before. Awesome. Um, awesome. We also have a piecemeal restore, which is a, a smaller, or more granular kind of restore. And then per page, if I happen to have page corruptions, that's an enterprise edition feature. Wow. So just like with backups, there are options on the restore statement as well, yes? Yep. So I not only have backup statements, of course, I have restore statements, I restore database, and I also restore log. Each with typical options. I've listed some of those here. Uh, these are ones you'll definitely want to be familiar with. And uh, in particular, when you take a look at restore log, notice that I can restore all the way to the end of the log, but I can also stop short of that particular point in time if I want to. Does that take care of those so-called user-induced errors? Yes. Yep. So as long as I have an idea of when uh, the uh-oh uh -oh occurred, then I can uh, pick a point in time. Awesome. A little caveat though, keep in mind the clock time on a system versus the watch that somebody's wearing versus real time, there might, those might not perfectly correlate. So if you think you're being very precise, you just might want to be careful about that. Good tip, good tip. So what about the system databases? Do we have things that we need to be worried about there? Are there different approaches there as well? Yep, uh, the system databases require some special treatment. So in the worst case, let's say master is corrupt. Okay. I'm not going to have a running SQL server at that time. You'll know it. Yeah, you'd get and go and try and start SQL and it's going to yell at yeah, you. Yeah, you're going to know it. So in fact, what I need is a, a basically a factory fresh puny little master just enough so that the SQL server service will start. After it will start, then I can restore the of course, I have a backup of master somewhere. One would certainly hope so. So I restore master, and then the rest of the planets will align. <laughs> All right. Now, that's when master is corrupt. When master is not corrupt, then I just need to restore right over the top of it. Keep in mind that master is aware of all the instance-level settings, instance-level security. 
It's aware of every database that's on the instance, every data file, every database option that's set on every database. So it's particularly important. So minimally, you should probably back up master whenever you do anything major for sure. Yeah, I have. And on a regular basis anyway. I, I, I agree with both of those. I would have a routine process that would back up my system databases at least daily. So I have at least that. But then I'd want to have a knee-jerk reaction. Anytime I make an instance level change, I would have a job that I could run ad hoc, so related to our previous module, and uh, that would back up the system databases and put that in some handy place. What about model, MSDB, tempdb, the other system databases? Are there any issues there that we should be aware of? Sure. If model is corrupt, then SQL Server, again, will not start. So I would have to uh, restore model from a backup. But as long as master or uh, uh, I lost my train of thought there. Yeah. <laughs> that would be the derailment. It happens. Yeah, there we go. So with model, then it's just like recovering a user database. Is yeah, that model, what you were trying to yeah. say? And uh, recovering MSDB, if uh, if it fails, then the agent service will not start. So I'm going to have to recover that in order to uh, start the agent service. And tempdb? What about tempdb? Is there anything there? No, there's nothing there. Why not? Well, I don't know. You tell me. Uh, the tempdb is rebuilt every single time that the instance is started, so you'll never incorporate that as part of your backup strategy. All right, so can we go take a look at the restores? Yeah, let's, let's take a look. We venture off into demo land once again. Let's see, what do we have up for this? Okay, let's see what happens. So let me make sure I have a folder that will accommodate our backups first. All righty. Let's see how this goes, Rich. We'll uh, be up for a little bit of excitement, make a couple of devices. <laughs> you always okay. wonder if the next one's going to break the trend. Yeah, all right. So I'm going to make a database, make some stuff in the database. Okay. Perform some changes. So I'm just going to, so notice... Create a bunch of columns. They have some default bunch of values. Tables and back it up. Yep. So next, back up my database in full. I'm going to run this one alone before I run the rest of them. You know, that's a whole lot better, isn't it? <laughs> I like seeing that backup yeah. statement work. Yeah. So then run some modifications, back up the log, and then I'm going to fast forward through a bunch of the rest of them. So basically, to sum it up, we're making changes to the database, adding data, modifying data, capturing the work through the backup log statements. That's right. So more changes, back up the log, more changes, back up the log, lots of changes. Okay. Then back up the database, notice, with differential. Okay, so, so the backup logs are capturing the work, the differential is capturing the data that's changed. In fact, uh, with the differential backup, notice the option I used to select that, it only marks the extents in the data file that have any particular change. This is kind of a play on statistics. Okay. What I mean by that is, um, within a database, there are often hot spots. So those tables that get the most action, that might be the biggest. So statistically, if only those extents that have changes occur within the differential backup, then that's hopefully not going to be anywhere near as much data compared to a full backup. So differentials typically you would use when you've got a small percentage of the database that's having the greatest percentage of changes done to it. A lot of action. Okay. Now, another advantage with the differential is that if I have aggressive log backups, let's say every 10 minutes, every 15, every 30, something like that. Picture uh, maybe the requirement to restore from 10 in the morning all the way to 6 p.m. That's an awful lot of log restores in that circumstance. And I have a general rule of thumb, as you know I often do. Yep. Whatever, reduce the amount of moving parts. Keep low the number of moving parts. And what I mean by that is the number of restore operations you want to minimize. Absolutely. Okay, so... What did I just do there? So now I have some more inserts, backup log. Let me just go to the bottom of this. Another differential, more log backups, and then we have to get to the exciting conclusion. Mm. And here we come. All right. 
So can we take a look at the contents of the device? All right, so now I can go to media contents and there's actually stuff there. I would probably want to expand these, but lots of useful information. Now, this is a pretty version of what I could also get by querying tables in MSDB, so keep that in mind. Okay. All right. Um, this part I'm going to use for the restore stuff. So that concludes the part on backing up. Did you the restore? So yeah. Did let's I speak? take a look at the restore part of yeah. it now. Yeah. So keep right on trucking there with it, George. Oh, you know what? I'm supposed to show that now. What do yep. you know? Yep, we got the backup working finally, so let's finish up with the restore now. Okay, so I want you to observe, if I refresh the databases node and look at the manufacturing database, it, it looks like any old regular database. Okay. So let's say something comes to my attention, maybe somebody can't query that database within that database, and I realize I had a media failure. All right. So now I can go ahead and back up the tail of the log, Capturing everything that happened since the last backup. <laughs> all right, and it would probably help if I actually ran all my code and used master. There we go. All righty, and after a refresh, I'd like you to make an observation. Notice this has kicked the database in the side and immediately placed it into a restoring state. Okay. And I want, you, I want you to see something wonderful here. Notice if I were to use the GUI and go to do a restore, it shows all of the elements that I would need to bring it up to the moment of, you know, all the way to the end of the log. So it does all of the telling you what needs to be restored based on the history tables. Yeah, and in fact, it shows, uh, it shows uh, that I need the most recent full, most recent differential, not all the differentials, yep. and then of course, all the logs that I'd need. Now, as bonus round, notice if I go to, let's see, I'm missing some of the user interface here. I'm looking for the point in time recovery. Main page. Do, 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 do. And that's going to be. Oh, you know what? Um, that might be. Let's see. Yep. Oh, timeline. Duh. Right there in front Come of our on. nose. Come on. All right, so from timeline here, notice I have the ability to restore not all the way to the end of the log file. That was the punchline. There you go. So we have a slider. We can use a specific date and time. Uh, in fact, you can use a date time value to go to milliseconds if uh, you had that degree of, uh, uh, that degree of detail. Awesome. All right, so that wraps up the uh, backup and uh, restoration portion. All right, so the next topic we're talking about here comes up when you have a situation where you want to move a database from one instance to another or something along those lines. Yeah, I have a dynamic environment, uh, especially if I have a pile of SQL servers, I might need to move a database to balance load. That's one possible reason. Um, I might want to put a copy of a database somewhere else. That's a possibility. Um, from a workload standpoint, I might want to balance the workload on a particular uh, on a particular LUN and just move one data file or move a log file. Maybe I add storage and I now want to move a file up to that. So that's what we'll take a look at next, moving databases and database files. And we'll find there's a division here, once again, between normal user databases and system databases. Oh, you got to treat the system databases special. What a great idea. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so moving and copying databases to other instances, multiple techniques, no surprise. We've seen this all along in the SQL Server product. Yep. We can use Management Studio. When in doubt, I'm going to right click. So I can right click on a database and perform a process called detaching it. Now, to compare something, if I were to right-click on a database and delete it... Yeah, that would scare the heck out of me. The files are gone. Yeah. Completely gone. Makes our last topic kind of important. Kind of important. If I merely detach a database, the files are still in the file system, but the SQL Server instance no longer has any claws or any hooks on them. And in fact, I could rename them, delete them, do whatever I want. They're just dumb files in the file system then. 
whereas something, uh, the data files, uh, when the database is attached, I cannot touch them, I cannot rename them, move them, nothing, which is why this procedure is relevant. So after I detach, I then would move one or more of the files, and then I would attach, that's the general procedure name, um, in contrast to using Management Studio, SSMS, I can use SP Detach DB, and I can also move or copy databases using SQL Server Integration Services. There are specific tasks for that, but yep. I can't talk too much about that. That's your thunder for Friday. Oh, you mean you want people to come back? Oh, yeah. That would be cool. Yeah, I got to dangle some hooks or some carrots out there for that. There There's a lot go. of fun stuff there on Friday. I'm looking forward to Friday. <laughs> so, a as a newer procedure, uh, using the SP attach DB, which has existed for a good long time, is being discouraged and now create database with some additional syntax elements and the for attach clause is now being promoted as the way to attach. Awesome. As with a number of uh, file maintenance and file manipulation operations, I have to use the logical file names, but what if I don't know what they are? Ah, uh, let me guess, you can query yeah, a catalog I, of, view. Of course, I have catalog views that will reveal everything like that. So let's move on. Take a look at relocating database files within a single instance. So if I want to move a database from one instance to another, I'll have to detach and then I can attach. But what if I just want to relocate one file within an instance? Well, I use alter database for that and no surprise, it will require the use of logical file names. So, Okay, and once you've done, you have to actually move the files well, too. Well, yeah, and then so. uh, I have to move the files in the file system and point properly. That makes sense. So what about the system databases? Yep, they need some special treatment. In particular, uh, master, if I, for whatever reason, that I would decide to move it, um, I'm going to have to use a special startup option. So I'll have to go into SQL Server Configuration Manager, um, you can look up the gory detail as long as you know you need a special switch. Is it minus M? Yeah. I, I, I think it's uh, minus M, but whatever, some startup switch, and then you'll restart the SQL Server service. Other system databases, they'll also require altered database, but you'll have to restart the SQL Server service. So with All that, right. let's take a look at moving a user database. So are we going to move it between instances this time, George? You know what? I don't even remember off the top of my head. Yeah. I, I have something. Uh, I have something squared away. All right. So, so first, I'm going to make a database in the default instance. So the default instance I've connected to down here, and I'm going to create a database called DB to be moved. Mm -hmm. I love your naming, don't you? It actually tells me what you're going to do with it. All right, so we happen to see this having been created in the graphical user interface. I see it here right now. So from here, I can go ahead and detach it. Now, I suppose it would be a little more dramatic if I tried to rename those files, drop them while the database is attached. It's not going to work. <laughs> but for right now, I'll click on OK and notice this is no longer part of the default instance. Now, it didn't delete the files. It just disconnected it from the instance. And in fact, we're going to see this because now what I want to do is attach that database to another instance, whether this is halfway around the planet or, you know, another machine in the rack that's immaterial. Okay. The process is the same. So let me go to Windows Explorer, and I have to move a couple of things. All righty. Let me get my task bar here, and we'll find... In the default instance, here is my database to be moved. The other instance is in the marketing folder. Now that's my data file. Next up, I'm going to have to go to the log L, file L, L. in the L drive. There we go. L, and we'll take my log file and we'll move it to marketing as well. All right, next up. Let's go to the non-default instance, right-click on databases, and let's attach. Let's point to our new file location, db to be moved, and observe with the log file, it thinks, well, it's actually thumbprinted in the file where it thinks it's supposed to be, 
And guess what? It's, it's not there anymore. It's cheese was moved, All so right. we have to point appropriately. So now we have to go to the log file location. And here is db to be moved. Click on OK. And there and it is. And we are back in business. Very cool. All right, let's Very see if I had any cool other fun. Uh, eh. Let's call that good for now. <laughs> All right. So our next topic, George, we're going to be talking about something that really has a lot to do with the backups and restores, database integrity. Yeah, it's not likely that the database engine will ever, uh, or I should say, it's not likely that databases are corrupted. But before you back up a database that uh, is, you don't want to back up a database that's corrupted. No. You'd like to find out if it's corrupted and then maybe proceed in a maintenance routine through the backup process. So we have to take a look in general at ensuring uh, back, uh, I'm sorry, database integrity. And this is going to involve uh, the use of some DBCC statements. This would be part of your normal maintenance routine, like we saw uh, maintenance routines uh, in an earlier module today. So we're going to take a look at DBCC in general, and then specifically related to integrity checking statements. Okay. How we execute it, and in the rare and unfortunate event that it reports errors, what we're going to do about it. Oh dear. So what is DBCC after all, right. all? So first of all, it's uh, the name or the uh, you know the acronym starts for database console command. This is a new version of the acronym. Formerly, it was database consist. Easy for me to say, database consistency checker. <laughs> and now, as you can see, or as you would see from the link, there are lots of DBCC statements. Okay. The time when a database might become corrupt would not so much be likely with the SQL Server system, but with the I.O. system. Maybe I have a corrupt caching controller or a host bus adapter or something like that. Now, some of the statements that we'll see in DBCC, they're categorized. We have informational statements, validation statements, maintenance, etc. So there are lots of those. It would probably be a good tour of duty to uh, at least become basically familiar with some of them. DBCC can be an extremely useful tool when you're looking at the databases. So the one that we're going to look at now, uh, let's go to the next slide, is DBCC Check DB. And its purpose is to validate integrity of the database structure and the data inside it. Strangely, it actually spawns other processes, other DBCC statements like check allocations, check table, and DBCC check catalog. Okay. Um, if I have a large database whose integrity I'm attempting to check, uh, there are some options I might want to consider, namely because it might take seriously hours and hours and hours to run this. So notice some of the, uh, some of the options that we have. Physical only, no index, all error messages. This might be if I just want to see error messages. I don't care about all the detailed reporting yep. that it can provide if I want. And another one, estimate only. So just give me an estimate. Of what it would take. Um, next up, uh, in the rare circumstance where a database would have corruption, we have repair options. And this part is easy. There are only two. The other part that's easy is if there's corruption that's reported, it will state what the minimum required repair option of the two is in order to fix something. So it'll tell you what you need to run. It will tell you what you need to run. Now, my database is going to have to be in single user mode. And I'll use, as we saw earlier, that's a database availability option. I'll have to go to alter database to put that in single user mode. Okay. And now for the two options that I have, repair, rebuild. Notice no loss of data integrity within the database. And it does some shuffling under the covers to put the database back in good order. Now, very unfortunate. If you are advised to use the repair allow data loss option, this is absolutely the last resort. This is if you have no backups, absolutely out of altitude and ideas, as they say. Uh, this is your only choice. Picture a gun to your head. You, oh, you, you dear. Just, you have no other choice, and then that's, that's when you're going to pick that. All right. Now, after, um, after you perform your operation, you're going to want to make sure that it doesn't occur again. So you're going to have to aim at getting to the root cause. 
Okay, can you show us how it's done, George? Yeah, let's take a look at uh, using DBCC CheckDB and some of the things that it reports. All right. And let me make sure I'm connected to the right instance. So I'll run DBCC CheckDB targeted at a particular database, and you'll notice it's... Boy, there's a lot of messages there. It's somewhat verbose. Lots and lots and lots of stuff here. So I got to read through all that to find out if my database is all set? This is kind of like the boss that says, I'm thinking of Elise here, just give me the facts, please. <laughs> are, are we okay? You know. So you'll notice at the end it says, uh, Elise is here in the room. Uh, she's managing our project here. Notice it says zero allocation errors, zero consistency errors. So it, told, it took all that yeah, to get I, to that conclusion. Okay, tell me, George. Is there a less verbose way of doing it? Let's take a look at running DBCC with no info messages. That would be a good one. So Comes we'll run back. that. Notice this database is not particularly large. And what did we get? Yep, um, you're okay. <laughs> yep, you're okay. All right. All right, now I have a problem, child. Let's see. Okay. I want to make sure my path is right here. All right, so we have so D let's... SQL admin jump starts. Got that one in the wrong spot, huh? Did I put that on F? Okay, well, that yep, was an easy change. That's fix. an easy change. Change it from D to F. Okay. Let's see if that dog will bark. There we go. All right. You've been a patient guy with me, Rich. I try, George. I yeah, try. you know you got to be, though. That's probably because I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt on these things once or twice yep. myself. Hey, wait a minute. There's red ink. Ooh, red ink can be bad. Hey. So we observe down below there are errors. Okay. No allocation errors, but there are consistency errors, and it got worse than that, not in red. What's my only available fix here? Repair allowed data loss. Now, strangely, how might someone even be, become acquainted with this? Well, I might perform a query, and notice I'm doing a select star. So all yep. columns, all rows, this yep. is going to retrieve every page in the table. Ew. Logical consistency based? Yowza. Yeah, so let's say an error like this is reported from an end user. They're going to call uh, help desk, tech support, something like that. Somehow that's going to get to the data team. But take a look at this. Notice, depending on where the query is made, there might be unaffected areas of the same table. So some of the data is good, some of the data is not. Yep, and just a little, this is a little ad hoc here, Rich. Let's say I selected star from MSDB dot, I think it's DBO suspect pages. Ooh, on target. This would also show up to 1,000 corrupted pages, pages where the checksum didn't match the data that was read. That's one of those tables you'd really want to keep an eye on yep. over time. And strangely, um, the product is set to only store 1,000 rows of suspect pages. I think that's reasonable. I, if you hopefully have anywhere, you got, don't have that many. <laughs> if you had anywhere near 1,000 pages, uh, you have bigger problems. Mm -hmm. All right, so next... Alter database, set single user with rollback immediate. Oh, here we go over the waterfall, Rich. And we're doing that because we restored a corrupt backup. So we're, we're, that kind of gets rid of restorer, doesn't it? We, we lost all altitude and ideas. We had absolutely no other choice but to repair. So now let's go ahead and put the database back in production, so to say. Notice we can query the table now. We yep. at least don't get an error. And notice that, well, our That's integrity cool. has been maintained. The only thing is, though, it paid no attention to foreign key references, which means this shows we... all the order details that are no longer associated with orders. Basically, we are in seriously hurting shape. So we lost data. We lost data. Now, All right, that's I, the that end of that kind one. of is expected with repair allow data loss. Yeah.
All right, so what about other maintenance that we do? Are there things that we want to be aware of and things we want to take care of? Yep, last up, uh, last topic for this particular session is uh, dealing with indexes, statistics, maintenance. So we have to take a look at a couple of table structures that are out there, indexes, and then uh, some other objects and their maintenance. So with that up, let's go to table structures. If I were to create a table in SQL Server without any special options, we would see that A, the data is stored in pages as normal, but the pages are in no particular order within the data file. Okay. In addition, the rows within those pages are in no particular order. Okay, so it's just a heap of data. Just a heap of data. Now, All right. often, for various query improvement purposes, we will want to impose not only an order of rows within a page, but a logical order from page to page. Okay. And then some extra pages are stored outside of that clustered table that are used to navigate and find those objects. Okay. All right, so now that we know what the two table structures are, we have to take a look at what our indexing options are. There are various ways that we want to query data in SQL Server, and we have objects to make sure that those queries are efficient, index objects. Now, an index is just a list of sorted values. Let's, okay. let, let's keep it simple. And as an add-on, that list of values may impose uniqueness or it may not. I often find that the constraints that are used to make indexes are confused with the index names so to help you along the way, I've made a little matrix here of the different kinds of constraints and indexes and how they map. So what do, what do we need to be aware of with indexes other than the fact that they help us look stuff up? Invariably, over time, data is going to change and indexes are going to get fragmented. So that's going to impose upon us, the database administration team, to maintain those indexes. And we'll see a couple of ways that we're able to do that. Now, before I get there, well, there's another object we want to talk about, and that is statistics. What does statistics do for you? First of all, statistics are objects that, that basically compute the estimated number of rows or actually calculate the number of rows in a table. And this can be important for the query optimizer when it goes to produce a query execution plan. It may impact the join order of one table to another based on the number of rows in one table compared to another. And also, statistics will gather things like, uh, if I'm querying for the name Smith, I might have 10,000 Smiths. If I'm querying for a Squalachi, I might only have one, and that may impact the query execution plan. Okay. So statistics are valuable objects, is the, is the big picture here. All right. Now, some good news, if I can cut over to my virtual machine for a moment, let's take a look at the model database. And if I go to the model database, We'll notice under options, there are a couple of options here. Let's use green. First of all, we have the auto create statistics option, and we have the auto update statistics option. Now, on smaller databases, and I don't mean puny, but on something that's not gargantuan, these are fine to leave on. There are some that have some very strong opinions on whether or not these should be on, and for the largest databases, you'll probably want to have a background automation process uh, to uh, have those updated or create and update them. The impact here is that if I make a new database, it will have the same settings as model. Okay. So now that we know that, let's go back, uh, let's go back to our regular slide, if, we, if you would please. And we see that statistics can also become outdated as data changes. So we now have uh, laid on the table that there are indexes to maintain and statistics to maintain, which brings us to the topic of index fragmentation. Okay, and what's fragmentation all about? There are two kinds of fragmentation uh, that can occur in indexed uh, and, and table data. So we have internal and external fragmentation. Internal fragmentation is kind of like this. Let's say I have a little kiddie pool of water, okay. and I have a bucket that I want to use to carry the water from one place to another. If I only fill the bucket up halfway, I have to make double the number of trips. Makes sense. This is like a page of data that's only half full. 
SQL Server is going to have to read the page into memory in order to use it for querying, which means it's taking up twice the amount of space that it needs to, and uh, it's more I.O. operations to get the pages in. So often I don't want this. However, if I know I have lots of rows that I'm going to be adding in, then I may want to have it I have pages partially full. And there's a percentage that I can use to dictate that called fill factor. Now, external pages relates to the physical location of pages within a data file. And when they're spread out, the read-write head of, uh, uh, of the spindle is going to have to move. Anytime the read-write head has to unnecessarily move, that is a negative performance impact. And you don't want that. Now, so how do you how do you now get the maintenance to trigger off? How do you actually execute that maintenance? All righty. Well, one of the things that you'll want to do is uh, you may have a particular table that seems to be performing poorly. So one of the things that I may do, let's say I go to uh, our market dev database, pick a particular table, and let's say I go to a particular index, I can get properties on that. Okay. Now, this is when I would have the foreknowledge or concern about a particular index out of maybe 10,000 that I have in the instances that I operate. And notice that I can see the fragmentation here and the page fullness. Okay. General threshold. If I see a number above 30%, I'll want to perform one operation. If I'm maybe 10 to 30%, I want to perform another operation. Okay. So with that, what are those operations that we want to do? Yeah, those operations, I wanted to go back to the slide for just a second. I showed how you could use the GUI, uh, and this is the uh, index fragmentation page. So I think that's back one. Perfect. So at the bottom, you'll notice I can use the graphical user interface to determine fragmentation. And also, I have a dynamic management object, some of those we looked at early on. This is a very broad-reaching DMF. Notice that I can look database-wide across all indexes in the instance to determine fragmentation and more granular than that. Okay, let's go on then. And then finally, notice that I have automation steps that I can use to maintain indexes. For indexes, I can reorganize them, which is more of a shuffling and modest efficiency improvement, modestly improving of uh, fragmentation. And then rebuild actually takes space to completely recreate the index and then collapses the old one and replaces with a brand new rebuilt index. Uh, rebuilding takes more time. Enterprise Edition has some online versions of the maintenance operations. And a curious thing, when I reorganize an index, if I cancel that in the middle, the work that's been done up to that moment is retained. If I cancel a rebuild, well, it never made it to the finish line. That I'm not able to use. Oh, that's too bad. You'll notice from the graphic uh, on the side also, I'm using the uh, SSIS version of the maintenance task. Notice I can rebuild an index, reorganize, and I also can update statistics. These are very granular. So, so rebuild and reorganize are exclusive to each other. You wouldn't do one and then the other. No. You'd do one or the other. That's right. So what I might do is first have a query that looks for uh, those objects which have a certain threshold of fragmentation and reorganize those. And completely separate, look for those objects that have a greater threshold of fra uh, fragmentation, and then I would rebuild those. All I, right. I do want to go on record saying there are lots of very polar ideas about what the proper thresholds are, how often you should do this, whether or not you should even bother doing that. So uh, do a little bit of research there. And now All the right. final thing, let's see, you want to see this last one? I think we can do this last demo, yeah. absolutely. Okay, I think it's pretty quick, but let's see. So in this one, we're going to go and, and after we've already looked at the fragmentation as you did in your last little demo. Now we're going to actually do some maintenance on an index, George. Oh, you know what? Oh yeah, here we go. All right, so what do we got going on here? All right, so I'm going to create a table in tempdb and I'm going to populate it with some data. Okay. 
Next up, the population. So we're going to put uh, 10,000 rows in this. And hopefully that one doesn't take too, too long. Boy, that's good. Sequels quick. I like yeah. that. All right, next, let's check the level of fragmentation using a dynamic management object and notice the, num uh, the number of inputs that this function can take and notice options like detailed. All righty. So we've got a clustered index on the table and it's telling us what, George? All right, so now I see the average fragmentation in percent at the moment. Okay. And another one of uh, particular importance is the average page space used. Notice it can't be more full than 100%, so it's fairly jammed packed. I'd say 99 point something is pretty doggone good. Now, there's some fun query code written here to scramble everything around and fragment the heck out of the data that's within that particular table. Okay. So this time around... We'll now query using the same dynamic management object, but observe now the fragmentation in percent. Yeah, boy. And let's also take a look at the average page space used. Notice okay. much less used. Now, one of my maintenance options is to use alter index all, and that says on behalf of a table object that I have, I'm going to rebuild all indexes. Okay. So, uh, that went pretty quick, so that I would say that quick. was a pretty small table. Pretty small table. So now let's go ahead and determine if there is any fragmentation that remains after a rebuild. You probably can predict the end of the movie, right? Yeah, so let's hope so. Average fragmentation in percent, zero. Awesome. All right, awesome. and then average page space used in percent, there we go. Back up to a good level. Very cool. All right. So in this session, we took a look at uh, data file maintenance, other kinds of maintenance, uh, data stewardship. And uh, next up is security. Yeah. We will be back in just about 10 minutes. Thanks very much. See you in a few.